You may want to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Psalm 23, because that's where we're going to be spending our time again this morning. You'll remember we began last Lord's Day to look at this remarkable psalm as, as part of a series in which we're examining some of the names by which Jesus is known in Scripture and just unpacking them and trying to understand our wonderful Savior better um, as each of these names shines a light on his character for us. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning last week, uh, this is the name that Jesus gave to himself. He identified himself as the shepherd that, uh, that we've seen in many of the Old Testament passages we've looked at. And in John 10 and verse 11, Jesus uh, says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So <clears throat> with that very brief introduction to the subject, let's refresh our memories of what the psalm actually says, the whole of it, um, although we're going to focus our attention this morning on the last uh, three verses. So Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May God bless that reading of his word. Remember how <clears throat> we're looking at the psalm under this overall banner of the shepherd of this sheep shall not want. They shall not lack uh, for anything. And last week we saw uh, that they don't lack for food, spiritually speaking, because we're looking at this as a, as a spiritual analogy. They don't lack for safety. They don't lack for rest. They lie down in the green pastures of the Word of God. They don't lack for nurture to have one who gently leads them beside quiet waters. They don't lack for the waters of life, living waters of the Holy Spirit. They don't lack for correction and guidance because the shepherd restores their soul, turns them around, guides them back into the good path and does so so tenderly, so gently. We saw that Jesus does this for his name's sake. It's his name that's on the line. None of those for whom he laid down his life at Calvary can be lost, shall be lost. Otherwise, his name is injured. His reputation is ruined. He must save all who put their trust in him. It's a wonderful, wonderful beginning to the psalm, and I, I hope we were encouraged by it, especially since it's the same for us under the New Testament. This wasn't some kind of old covenant blessing that David identified and, and found such comfort and blessing in. It's exactly the same for us. It's what Paul says to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. And what confidence he says it with. And my God will supply all your needs according 
to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You know, there's a difference between giving out of your wealth. If I've got a billion dollars, I could give you 10 cents and I've given you out of my wealth. If I've got a billion dollars and I give you according to my wealth, you're going to get more than 10 cents, right? Well, how much are the riches of glory in Christ Jesus? What kind of number will you put on those? Because it's according to that that God will supply all the needs of his people. Well, now we want to come on and look uh, at the final three verses of this psalm. And we're going to continue this same idea of we shall lack nothing because. Because that is throughout this psalm. And we're going to see that our souls shall not lack his presence. Our souls shall not lack his lavish provision. And our souls shall not lack assurance. So first then, in verse 4, our souls shall not lack his presence. And, and the, the words we're going to be focusing in on out of that verse for the next few moments are uh, hopefully on the screen behind me. You are with me. You are with me. And the question is, what happens to Jesus' sheep at the very worst moments of life? Moments that are described here as walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And the word that's translated here, shadow of death, is a very emphatic word. It's one of the strongest words you can use for darkness and terror uh, in the Hebrew, apparently. It's the word that's uh, used in Job 24 and verse 17. For the morning is the same to him as thick darkness, for he is familiar with the terrors of thick darkness. And, and the words there, thick darkness, they are the same, uh, it's the same word that's translated shadow of death in Psalm 23. A time of, of darkness, a time of terror, a time of, uh, of almost despair. I don't know if you've ever been to the Moaning cannon, uh, Caverns. You go down that very scary, at least it was to me, endless spiral staircase that doesn't seem to be held up by anything. And you get to the bottom, and they take you a few feet out from the staircase, and then what do they do? They turn off the lights. You know what that darkness is like? You know, when the Lord brought plagues against Egypt. One of the plagues was darkness, and it's described there as a darkness that can be felt. And we go through these times spiritually. Um, what kind of, of life events might David have in view here? Well, many. Uh, perhaps it's a, a time of uh, danger where death is a very real possibility. Surrounded by enemies seeking to destroy you. Certainly David knew that situation. A bit like the sheep among wolves. Perhaps a deep time of spiritual affliction. A time of darkness of the soul. Certainly believers can and do know those times. We have an enemy who, Scripture tells us, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And if he is breathing on your neck, that can be a time of tremendous terror and darkness for you. Perhaps it's a time of serious and, and prolonged illness, a physical affliction could be any of those times, but it also most certainly includes the one that is perhaps most on the surface, 
the time when our departure from this world comes into view. We approach the grave and we're beset with temptations to fear and to doubt. Have I really put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I really safe? And all of these times are our lot uh, as the sheep of this shepherd. There isn't a believer, I don't think, who goes through this world trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ who doesn't know one or other of these events and perhaps several of them in their lives. They are very dark and dreadful times. And there are households here today in the fellowship that are going through times like this. There are believers here today, I know there are, who are having times of darkness and difficulty. And what happens in these times? That's the question, isn't it? That's the important question. What's going to happen in these times? We've just been through this wonderful uh, litany of, of abundant provision in the first three verses of the psalm, the, the green pastures of the Word, the quiet waters of the Holy Spirit, the turning back to Him, the guiding through the paths of righteousness, the gentleness and the tenderness. Does that go away when we get into these times? Well, no, it doesn't. I think sometimes we lose our ability to understand that it hasn't gone away. But it doesn't go away. And we know it doesn't go away because of what David tells us here. The first thing to note about the valley of the shadow of death is this. The sheep don't lie down in this place. They lie down in the green pastures we talked about not going through those in a high-speed train. They're not lying down in the valley of the shadow of death. They're going through. And if they're going through, they're going to come out on the other side. Right? They're not in this place forever. Thank God. They will come out on the other side. And, and why is David so certain of that? It's because of these four words. You, my shepherd, this is more than four, you are with me. My shepherd is with me. He's not like that hired hand that we read of in, in our meditation, the one who sees the wolves coming and thinks, well, this, this is above my pay grade. It's more than my job's worth to take on these wolves and look after a bunch of sheep. I'm out of here. Not the Lord Jesus Christ. He stays with his sheep through thick and thin. Um, there are wonderful passages. I mean, the scripture is just full of this language of shepherding and care and concern. It's good to dwell on it. Here's, here's one in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. I'm sure you know it. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. You can't read that passage without thinking about Daniel's friends, can you? In going into the furnace of fire, heated seven times hotter than ever before. Even the people throwing them in the fire were consumed by the flames before they actually got to the furnace. And the three men fall in. And then they look from outside from a safe distance and say, didn't we put three men in there? Certainly. Well, who's the fourth one who's with them then? Looking like a son of the gods. He is with them in that trial and he brings them out of it. So that's the first thing. We're passing through. And we know we will because he's with us. 
and he's promised to be with us, and he doesn't break his promises. But second, one thing that he's with us, but who is it that's with us? Because it was, if it was the best friend in this world that we ever had in our lives, that would be commendable and it would give us some degree of comfort. But they couldn't help us, could they? They couldn't bring us out of a fiery furnace. But remember what we read in, in Isaiah 40. Remember this shepherd, so gently carrying the lambs. Perhaps we'll put it up on the screen. I may not read it, but so gently carrying the lambs, leading the nursing ewes with such care and such love. And yet he's the one who spread out the heavens like a tent to dwell in. He's the one who knows the names of all of the stars and makes sure that not one of them is missing. He is the one who summoned everything in the universe into being by a word. He's the one who's with you in that valley of darkness. Makes a bit of a difference, doesn't it? When you have a shepherd in love with you the way he is in love with you, who has shown his love for you the way he has shown his love for you, and he is the Almighty, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he has decided he will save you. That helps you get a bit of a better view in the midst of the valley of darkness, doesn't it? If thou art my shield and my sun, the night is no darkness to me. Fast as my moments roll on, they bring me but nearer to me. So what if the body perishes? So what? Because it's only here for a short while anyway. And that's the worst that any of our enemies could do to us. And then there is in store for us a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give us on that day. So the question is, are you in one of these valleys of darkness this morning? A time of fear and, and, and depression for your soul. Thick darkness. You know, I couldn't find any commentators to really comment on this, but look, as I looked at the tense in which David wrote this, I think he could have been writing this psalm in the middle of a valley of darkness. He could have written about the green pastures and the living waters and so on. And then he comes on to this and says, even though I walk through this valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. And uh, certainly if he wasn't in, in that time, he, he knew lots of times when his life was on the line, when he was risking everything for the Lord, and, and the enemies came after him like a pack of wolves, and he knew the Lord was with him, and the Lord brought him through and delivered him. And because the Lord is with him, there are a couple of consequences that, that follow from that, that that David gives us here. The first is this. If he is with us, and we've considered his credentials uh, as, as such a powerful and loving shepherd, if he is with us, we should fear no evil. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Um, Psalm 27, verse 1, it parallels Psalm 23 in many ways. Another Psalm of David. And in the first verse, he says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Crazy, isn't it, when you think about it, that we take it upon ourselves to get all worked up and afraid for our own safety and security when this God, this Savior, has pledged himself to be our shepherd. 
Many of you will uh, know the movie Gods and Generals. It, it shines a spotlight onto Stonewall Jackson. And there's a scene where he's on the back of his horse riding up and down the ranks of the army getting ready to go into war and there are musket balls zinging one side and the other side. And, and afterwards, I think it was a captain came up to him and said, yeah, how is it that you, you managed to do that? That you, you sit on that horse like a stone wall and all these musket balls are flying around you. You could lose your life at any moment. How do you do that? And he was a very, very godly man, regardless of your views on the conflict that was taking place. The Lord was, was remarkably with him. And this was his answer to the captain. Captain, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that. But to be always ready, no matter when it may overtake me, Captain, that is the way all men should live. And then all would be equally brave. What's he saying in the midst of his valley of the shadow of death? He's with me. We don't want to put God to the test, but I don't think he was doing that. I don't think it was a foolish confidence. Um, but it's true. You know, I spend a lot of time at 35,000 feet, as, as you know, and sometimes the plane bounces around a lot. And uh, I didn't used to like it. I still don't really care that much for it. But I do think this to myself right now, when that happens, there's nowhere that I could be right now where I could be safer than I am right now. This is the safest place for me. And uh, the Lord will decide what is best for me. And that's so good to know. We should fear no evil if He is with us in the valley of darkness. And the second consequence that, that, that David dwells upon here, because he is with us, we should be comforted. He carries with him these two implements of a shepherd. The rod uh, to count the sheep, make sure none of them has got lost. To defend the sheep, to lash out at, at the wolves and any other enemies who come. And uh, you better believe that this shepherd has a pretty amazing rod. He's going to crush the nations, dash them to pieces like pottery. Um, but then he has the staff. The staff is used to draw a sheep to the shepherd so that the shepherd can examine them closely, um, to care for them. I read one account where when a lamb is born, the shepherd doesn't want to pick it up in his own hands to examine it uh, because uh, then the mother might smell the shepherd on, on the lamb and, and might reject the lamb. There's the staff just to lift up the lamb and to be able to look at it without handling it. Such care. To guide as well, just a little tap here and there to make sure that the sheep stays on the right path. And when you take that into the spiritual realm, aren't those things a comfort to us when we're in those dark valleys? To know that we can't get lost. To know that uh, if we're feeling correction from Him, that's because He loves us. That's a comfort that He's with us in the midst of these times. To know how much He cares. To know His guidance and His direction. Uh, and to remember this, he's with us forever, wherever we might be. Um, I love Psalm 139. I wish we had time to read some of these passages this morning. But the whole question through the psalm is, where can I go where you won't be? If I go to the other side of the sea, you're there. If I go down to the depths, you're there. There is nowhere where I can go where you are not. And that's your shepherd. 
There's nowhere where you can go where he will not be present and concerned for you and leading and guiding you as your shepherd. Think of what he says in Hebrews as well, chapter 13 and verse 5. Make sure your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. What do you have? He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. You've heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again. If you get into the Greek underlying that phrase that's in capitals there, it's a five-fold emphasis. I will no, not, never leave you. I will not ever forsake you. Over and over and over again, it can't happen. It won't happen. So even when the time comes for us to face the last enemy and to go through the last valley of the shadow of death. Dare we think that he will leave us to sink in trouble and that he will lose us then? We can't think that. He will be with us in that valley too and he will most certainly bring us through. If we are his sheep, he is the death of death and hell's destruction to all who are his sheep. That's why Paul calls out in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, grave, where is your sting? He's taken away the sting of death. And there is no victory for death anymore because he has conquered it. And that is the one who will be with us as we go through this last valley. So friends, if if you're in a valley of darkness, a valley of the shadow of death this morning, take comfort an encouragement from this. He hasn't deserted you if you are his. He can't. He won't. He is with you. And that should be a comfort to you. And that should relieve you of your fear. You will. You must come through. There is a wonderful hymn uh, which we really need to learn. It's written by a Welsh pastor who I think just recently retired. Uh, We used to know him somewhat, uh, ministered in Cardiff over many years. Very, very sickly man. And very often laid aside in illness, very weak. uh, Sometimes, I think, in, in danger for his life. And he wrote this hymn, and the title of the hymn is, I Saw a New Vision of Jesus. And it carries on. It's a view I'd not seen here before. Regarding him dear and so precious with beauty I had to adore, I stood on the shore of my weakness and gazed at the fear of, uh, at the brink of such fear. It was then that I saw him in newness, regarding him dear and so fair. And it's about being in the valley of the shadow of death and the shepherd being with him. And he says uh, towards the end of of one of these verses, I've not really thought about it being a reference to Psalm 23, but it certainly is. He says this, In shades of the valley's dark terror, where hell and its horror hold sway, my Jesus will reach out in power and save me by his only way. You will come through. You must come through. There is no other outcome that is remotely possible if you have cast yourself upon this shepherd this morning. So that is the first thing. We shall not lack his presence with us 
as we go through the valley of the shadow of death. Secondly, though, we shall not lack his lavish provision. I've come through the valley now, and uh, we're out on the other side, and the picture changes. Changes to the picture of a, a, a feast that's prepared for the one who is the Lord's. And uh, it, it's called, you, you, you prepare a table before me, and that means in, in full view. It's a bit like what's going to happen uh, after the morning service here. The table is going to be prepared in full view of all the people who are going to eat from it. And uh, we really appreciate that service, but it's that kind of picture. It's not a hidden thing, this table. It's not a secret. This is the table that's prepared, and it's prepared for all those who belong to the Lord. We need to think of it, of course, as a spiritual banquet. We're taking the whole of this psalm in a spiritual sense. Okay, so this is a table that's prepared for those that God loves. What kind of a, a banquet do you think that might be? What do you think is going to be lacking? Do you think you'll come to that table and say, oh, you know, I really like chips and dip, and uh, that's missing. What a shame. I, I don't think it's going to be like that. Do you think any of it will be overcooked so that you, you take a piece of meat and it clatters onto your plate uh, when, you, when you put it on the plate? Or do you think anything will be underdone? You start wondering if you're going to come down with food poisoning. Anything that will be harmful to you there? Anything at all that might taste bad? You put it in your mouth and you sort of think, oh, I wish I hadn't taken that. It's not going to be possible, is it, in this banquet? Nothing will taste bad. Nothing will do you harm. It's all going to be perfect. Every single dish perfectly prepared. Exquisite dishes for the soul. No spiritual equivalent of, of a McDonald's Happy Meal with a little trinket in there to keep you happy. Um, after uh, what is supposed to pass for food is, is finished. Not like that. Not in view of what it stands for. Here is meat. Here is substance. Here is marrow and fatness. Everything that is good for the soul laid out on this table. And see who prepares it? You. My shepherd. My God. You prepare a table for me. Think about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. A staggering act. Well, here is God preparing a table for those who are his. And he does more than that. This is where lavish comes in, okay? He prepares this table, and that's incredible. There's, n there's no table that will ever compare with it in terms of, of, of lavish provision of, of so many perfect things for the soul. It's, it, it's hard to find words uh, in our poor language to, to describe how re remarkable and glorious this is. But he does more than that because he anoints our heads with oil. And when we come to take our drink, our cup is just flowing over. It's so lavish. He has spared nothing. He has poured everything into this meal, this feast, this banquet. And the anointing and the cup overflowing, these are signs, aren't they, of welcome, of honor, and of blessing. He's holding nothing back. And how great is the blessing when the infinite God who has loved you from before the foundation of the world brings you to this table and prepares it in your presence. He deluges good things on you. He holds nothing back. It's a flood. It's lavish. It's more than generous. It's abundant. 
And he does it for you. I wonder if you have ever sat like a, at a spiritual table like that. I think we, as believers, it's possible. We do have tastes of that banquet. He does bring us through that valley of darkness. And when he's brought us through, here's the banquet. Here in this world, we can know it. Of course, it's, it's a foretaste, and we'll come to that in a moment. But I think all of us who have been to that table and eaten what the Lord provides for our souls in that meal figure out that it was well worth going through the valley if this is what is at the end of it. This banquet, this blessing from the Lord. And what about those enemies who We're on our heels, breathing on our necks in that valley of darkness. What about them? They're going to spoil the feast now? They're going to come charging in and turn the table over? No. God's not going to allow that to happen. This uh, text actually says, He prepares the table before you, which is in your full view. But he prepares it, and the word means very conspicuously and very prominently in the presence of your enemies. So they're there, and they can see exactly what's happening, but they can do nothing to spoil it. It's being done, in in our language if you like, in their faces. All right, this is what I do for my sheep. You thought you were going to destroy them. No way. Look what I do for the ones that I love. And they are made to watch as we sit down to this extraordinary feast. And they are totally confounded. Think of Job and and the valley that he went through. And he came out on the other side. You remember that conversation that took place in heaven to begin with? Have you considered my servant Job? Is there anybody like him? And and the devil sort of says, well, yeah, but. And everything that happens in Job's life, Job never flinches. By the grace of God, he is kept. Can you imagine the conversation in heaven at the end when Job repents and everything is restored to him? Can you imagine what God might have said to Satan then? Told you so. I love him and I'm not going to let anything happen to him. And you now have to watch as I make my blessing, pour out my blessing, lavish my blessing on him. Remember what it was like for Haman at the time of Esther? Wanted to destroy the Jews, particularly hated Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down before him. Planned his execution, built the gallows, goes in to see the king, and the king discovers that Mordecai uncovered a plot to assassinate the king. And he said, well, what's been done to honor him? Nothing. So in comes Haman to get the Jew, get Mordecai strung up. And the king says, "Uh, Haman, what should be done for the one the king delights to honor? And Haman thinks, well, he's got to mean me, wouldn't he? I mean, who would he rather honor than me? So he says, well, put him on a horse, cover him with this great robe, lead him through the city and proclaim, this is what is done for the one the king delights to honor. Well, it's just like that. Right in the face of the enemies, the Lord spreads out this table. You know, the, the Bible talks about processions. He's going to take his church and he's going to parade through glory and he's going to put us on display to all the forces in the heavenly places. He's going to show what is done for those the king delights to honor. So rest assured that when we come to that last valley and we go through that last valley as we certainly will, what's the next thing that happens? We sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all Satan's efforts to discredit God and to destroy his church will be seen to have been completely overturned. And I am sure it will be done in his face for him to see what a failure all of his plans 
than all of his schemes have been. Well, lastly, our souls shall not lack assurance. And that's in verse 6. And you can almost follow David's reasoning here. And we could reason the same way, perhaps, looking back on the whole psalm. If this is the situation I am in because of God's grace, if I have this green pasture to eat, if I have these quiet waters to drink, I'm sustained by His Word and by His Spirit. And if when I go through this valley of the shadow of darkness, He's going to be with me so that I don't need to fear any evil and, and, and His presence, the rod and the staff are going to be my comfort and make sure that I stay on the right track and I don't get lost. And if when I come through that time by His help, He's going to prepare a table for me. And it doesn't matter what my enemies, they'll be there to see it, but it doesn't matter. They can't spoil it. It's going to be done right in their faces. And they're going to be powerless to prevent my blessing. If all of that is true, and it certainly is, then what is my lot here on earth? Well, it's goodness and compassion from God. Certainly. Surely, goodness and compassion will follow me all the days of my life here on earth. And then when I pass through that last valley of the last enemy, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Nothing can prevent it. Nothing shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. That is irrefutable logic. If you follow what happens in the first five verses of this psalm, the, the sixth verse has to happen. There could be no other outcome because of all that the shepherd has committed to do and because of all the blessings that are promised here. You couldn't write a different conclusion to the psalm. And that means that we who are his sheep should rejoice. And again, it's not an old covenant thing that somehow has disappeared now that we're in the new covenant. Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 1 and verse 6, I am confident, confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. How we should praise Him. So let's just have a few words of conclusion. Believer, uh, what a good shepherd you have. Uh, you couldn't have a better one. You couldn't even begin to think of what a better one might look like. He's the best. And how this should speak peace and comfort to your soul. And how you should rejoice this morning if you are part of his flock. How you should be filled with this expectation. This hope of glory that he has provided for you. How should we react? Well, even if now we have to go through various trials and difficulties. We can know that these two have been sent for our good. We can know for certain that he is with us in the midst. We can know for certain that we will come through them. It cannot be otherwise. And we can praise him. Praise him, you adopted children of the household of God. Love him you brothers and sisters by adoption of the Good Shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship Him, you kingdom and priests of His heavenly calling. He has given you everything so that you might be His without fail forever. And we'll just 
read here a few verses from Psalm 27. I told you it, it echoes Psalm 23, and you'll pick that up very clearly. But again, here is the comfort. Here is the confidence. Here is the blessing. And here is the, the hope. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And so should you. And so should I, if we are indeed his sheep. But now a word to the unbelievers again this morning. Uh, you know who you are. We certainly know and suspect who some of you are. And um, I hardly know what to say this morning to you. What do you actually have in your life this morning that is so precious to you that you don't want Jesus to be your shepherd? What do you have? Where are you being led? And who is the hired hand who's leading you? Someone who certainly doesn't care for your soul. That much we know. As it is, without Christ, your souls are lifeless. Like uh, the description of, of the church at Laodicea we heard quite recently, your souls are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But you don't know it. Some aren't even paying attention now when your whole soul could depend upon whether you listen and whether you actually turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You possess nothing of value here on earth and you have a desperate and a desolate eternity ahead of you. And this is the one thing that you may not perhaps understand, certainly in this society. It's your fault. I used to tell our kids that if I had a dollar for every time they said it wasn't my fault, I could probably have retired years ago. It is your fault. This whole society tries to teach you and train you that nothing bad that happens in your life is your fault. This is your fault. It's your fault because the shepherd is offered to you every single week. It's your fault because he is here and he calls out to you every week. It's your fault because he reaches out for you every week. Remember how he wept over Jerusalem? How long, how long I longed for you to turn, come to me, and you would not. These things happen every week, and if you pay attention and you don't zone out, then you proudly, obstinately, willfully, rebelliously will not come to him. So whose fault is it? that your soul is in the condition it's in this morning. You're going to try and blame God because you won't come when he's inviting you sincerely to have your sins taken away by the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you got your protest speech ready for the day of judgment? When you stand before God and he says, what have you got to say for yourself? Have you got your speech lined up and ready? 
It's your fault, God, because I wasn't elect. And you didn't zap me. I know I didn't want you, and I didn't look for you, and I didn't care for you, but surely you would have zapped me. And because you didn't, it's your fault I was never a Christian. Well, on that day, you will see that he has been right all along, and you have been so very, very wrong. You will understand that it was your fault. And you'll look at your protest letter and you'll realize it's nonsense. And every mouth will be stopped up on that day because they will see that God is right. He's always been right. And what are the chances that you would prevail against a God like this with your very distorted view of right and wrong and what good God should do and what he should not do. So you'll have nothing to say on that day and there'll be nobody else to blame on that day except yourself. And you will know it. And quite remarkably, we are here for another week and quite amazingly, he's reaching out to you again now because it can all change in a heartbeat if you will turn now. But you shouldn't put him to the test. You shouldn't try his patience and think that there will be another week when you can do it and another week after that and you can take your time. You shouldn't do that. He's calling to you again now. You should come. Look what kind of a shepherd he is. You don't want to say no to him. Well, may God have mercy on your souls. Let's spend a few moments in quietness and reflect on this wonderful psalm together. <laughs>